28th. This is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 10th of March, 2006, approximately 9.30 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Sure. Uh, William Watkins. I was born on January 16th, 1951, in Albany, New York. Okay. What was your... Uh, Educational background prior to entering service. I graduated from Colony Central High School uh, in June of 1969. Okay. Um, were you enlisted? Did you enlist or did you were you drafted? I actually enlisted in the delayed entrance program. So I actually signed up in Albany uh, in January of 1969, and I was put on active duty uh, approximately six seven days after I graduated in June of 69. Okay, why did you uh, select the Army? Well, I went to the Marines and they said, we'll guarantee you a place to sleep, not a bed, and food to eat, not hot. And I said, well, I don't think the Marines are for me. And I checked out the Navy, but I'm not crazy about water. So I decided with the Army, I actually enlisted for Airborne Ranger School. Um, when did you enter service, did you say? Uh, June of 69. All right, where did you go for basic training? Fort Dix. Okay. Uh, how long were you there? Uh, eight weeks, and then I did my advanced training for an additional ten weeks. Was that infantry training? I was uh, a radio teletype operator. Okay. So then I went on to uh, advanced radio teletype. Was that uh, Fort Gordon? That Fort Gordon was for my 05 Charlie, uh, MOS with crypto and, uh, yes, the Advanced Signal Corps. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, now, when did you go into the Special Forces? Well, this may have had something to do with my enlisting for uh, uh, Airborne Ranger. I had injured my ankle while at Fort Gordon, so I was unable to make uh, airborne training at Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. uh, I received my orders for Vietnam, I think roughly January of 1970, and it wasn't until I actually got in country in Vietnam that I realized I had been uh, assigned to the 5th Special Forces Group. Uh, so I hadn't done any type of Special Forces training. Mm -hmm. uh, here again, I was only in six months at that time. But I think part of the decision making was one, I was an enlisted person, which I soon realized in 1970-69, there were very few of us enlisting. Mm -hmm. uh, also, being a high school graduate probably didn't help uh, hurt. And I think that had something to do with my being assigned with the 5th. I proceeded to do my jungle training for uh, the 5th uh, on Hontre Island, which was in the South Pacific. That lasted about three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. What was that like, a survival school mainly? Yeah, I think it was probably a crash course that you would have, uh, uh, that everybody coming in took. Mm -hmm. What was interesting about it is I think I had a major on my left in a bunk and a captain on the right. Uh, rank and insignia uh, wasn't important. Everyone went through the same type of training, enlisted and officers. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would imagine it was probably a condensed course that you would have received if you had gone through Fort Bragg. It was it was intense, but it was uh, uh, it was fulfilling. It was mm -hmm. it was definitely interesting and professional. Do you think it was because you also had the the radio background that this is a possibility why you were? Well, you know, I graduated at top of my class at Fort Gordon, and what I found interesting when I got to Vietnam. Uh, where we were stationed, where the headquarters for the 5th Special Forces was, uh, we had the main uh, communication center. It had all the top communications gear, probably crypto. It was a well-enforced concrete bunker. And I assumed because my proficiency in, in Morse code and uh, typing and, and training that I had, I was going to be sitting in there. <laughs> I never went in the building. I ended up doing recon work with a hand radio to some extent, uh, though not a lot. Uh, I spent a lot of time working in the Mars station, mm -hmm. among other things. And for the most part, throughout my military career, the MOS I had been trained for that I had done relatively well in, I actually never did, So, which probably wasn't uncommon in the Army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
They um, found some. They found other things for me to do that mm -hmm. kept me busy, though. Such as. Well, uh, primarily working uh, Mars Station. Uh, now, what do you mean by that? Mars was the military affiliate radio system. Uh, this was here again, something I did on the side to some extent. Uh, ham operators operated in Vietnam. And what we would do is, because we didn't have the technology that we have today, to place a phone call inexpensively back home, there were, I think, eight Mars stations throughout Vietnam. You would make a phone call to me. When the frequencies were up, I would hopefully have contact with the United States, primarily the West Coast. And through a ham operator on the West Coast, I could transmit a telephone conversation, let's say. It would be by radio from Vietnam to, say, California. Mm -hmm. From the ham operator's location in California, they would have a phone line. Uh, they would make the phone call to anywhere in the United States. So there would be the uh, transmitting and receiving across the ocean, and then it would be a, a phone link between uh, the party I'm, I have with me in Vietnam, either on a phone uh, between uh, our radio station, the ham station, the Mars station, uh, someone from the Navy installation 10 miles away would call me. That would be a phone line, be radio from Mars station to Barry Goldwater. Mm -hmm. I'd talked to Barry Goldwater many times because he was a ham operator. Oh, yes, right. And then from Barry's home, there would be a phone link, mm -hmm. and that's how telephone conversations were transmitted. So the only charge would be the normal mm -hmm. uh, collect call being received by the party receiving the call from the servicemen of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting. It was very, it was it was interesting work. The hours were always different because the frequencies came and went. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to Dear John's. Guy would call home all excited. Girlfriend would tell him, "By the way, I'm seeing." somebody else. So those were heartbreaking, but yeah. it was also patching through emergency calls, trying to get, get a frequency up so that you could, uh, you know, someone got hurt or things like this. Uh, very, re probably the most rewarding work I did over there. It's just something really mm -hmm. you don't forget. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How secure was the base camp you were at? Well, here again, the fifth, this was their main headquarters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, I would imagine, uh, it was extremely secure. We didn't see a lot of action while I was there. Things were winding down in 70-71. Did you uh, experience the normal rocket attacks? <laughs> the first day in, uh, Charlie uh, blew up a, a large gasoline storage tank, you know, one of the big round ones, mm -hmm. which, you know, was pretty interesting for, you know, someone like me who had been in country, I think, about 48 hours at the time. and. Uh, coming up from Cameron Bay into Natrang and, you know, all the fireworks going on. Uh, there was the occasional mortar attacks, things like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, nothing, you know, after a while you just got used to it. You don't, you know, it's, right. you know as long as you're not the recipient of one on the head, it didn't do a lot of damage. But uh, that installation was, I would, it was probably as secure as any could be at that time. Mm -hmm. What kind of weapons did you carry? I had an M1 carbine, I had the M16, I had M M39, M69 grenade launcher, Seven, M79, M79. Uh, you know, your hand pistol, I think it was a Colt 45. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we had a crossbow, you know, that hung around. Uh, that was probably most of it, you know, the other stuff we would requisition if we needed it. Mm -hmm. You said you went on some recon missions? Yeah, it was typical stuff. It would be just, uh, uh, you know, not too far from the base camp. You know, there's certain forays that were done uh, uh, with the Montyards in tow or, or whatnot to check out certain information or whatnot. I was 18 at the time. I think I turned 19 uh, just as I got in country. And... Uh, uh, for the most part, you know, I did what I was told. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that I worked with were seasoned via, uh, seasoned second tour Green Beret. Uh, sort of intimidating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, most of the time, I was under their wing. So it was, you know, days came and went, and you just mm -hmm. did your job. 
Did, yeah. did they uh, hold it against you at all? That Definitely not. I, I think all of them uh, or it came out in conversations over beers or whatever that I had enlisted, and as soon as they heard that, that put me in a different position. Mm -hmm. it, and I think that the things, the first thing I real, I was extremely naive when I went to Vietnam, and I'm sure you've maybe heard it before. I had enlisted one of maybe three people out of my graduating class. I was a high school quarterback, typical jock, but fairly well educated in a college entrance mm -hmm. uh, strata at the school. And probably not unlike many people today, I'd rather fight the communist in Vietnam than in Schenectady. Was sort of my mm -hmm. mindset. Mm -hmm. What was interesting, I think my third day in country, once I had gone up to uh, the perimeter camp of uh, Nha Trang where we were stationed, when they finally allowed us to visit the PX, PX was a couple miles away, had to travel down the road about a mile long, and then you would go in the main entrance for the 5th, and then from there you could catch a jeep or something to get down to the PX, where, uh, which was actually located where the air, air base was in the train. They had young Vietnamese that had 50cc Honda motorcycles. So as I came out the gate from uh, the perimeter station where I was, hey GI, get on the back. So I got on the back, took me down, got off, thanked the guy. Started to walk into the gate, and a guy screaming at me. Young kid, maybe 13 to 15, I don't know. And I turned to the guard, and I said, you know, what's the problem? What's this guy's problem? He says, you got to pay him. I said, what do you mean you got to pay him? He says, you got to pay him for taking you down here. I thought they were doing me, they were returning uh -huh. a favor because I was, I mean, I mean think of this. This is uh -huh. my mindset. And uh, all I can say is sincerely felt that. I couldn't understand why I should pay him when I was there helping him save his country. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that never left me. And I, you know, and it sort of changed my perspective, but I think it illustrates how naive I was and what I was doing there and how I perceived things. And uh, yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting. So I paid him his $2, two, 200 piastres or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you have much contact with the Vietnamese people? Well, I actually, with this 5th Special Forces and what I soon learned, uh, other than what I already knew from the movies or what you read in books or what you, what you heard, in 1970-71, uh, my understanding, and I have nothing to say that would disagree with the perception, there were only two straight units in Vietnam. You had your military police and the Green Beret. The others were now well entrenched with primarily draft draftees. Uh, with a one-year tour of duty, you had a third of a year to get acclimated, a third of a year where you may be effective, and a third of a year where you're covering your ass. Just want to leave. Mm -hmm. So at any time when we had 500,000 people there, I think, you know, uh, two-thirds of the force is probably not totally effective. The other problem was with the war winding down and the discontent at home. Uh, drugs were rampant in most of the other units. I mean, that's, I don't want to blemish everybody else. I mean, most of the soldiers did a good job and everyone who was there, but it's just the way the situation was. Uh, <clears throat> as I visited other units, it was evident that you could, there was a difference between those units and the unit I was assigned to. Mm -hmm. Now here again, having enlisted, this, you know, warrior image uh, and being assigned to the 5th was so fortunate for me, these were professional soldiers. And <clears throat> I don't think the officers looked down at the enlisted men. I think they respected the job, especially with the NCOs, who would probably were there on their third tour of duty. Uh, it was it was just the individuals in my unit were doing their jobs as professionals. Drugs were less. I'm not saying they weren't didn't exist, but it was it was a lesser situation. Uh, one of the things that I spent a lot of time doing there was uh, the base was basically off limits because of still a lot of insurgency and a lot of stuff going on in the, in the village city of Natrang. 
the only way you could get off base, other than during certain periods of time, uh, was to do certain activities. And one of them was, uh, I was asked if I wanted to go downtown and, and teach English. And it was the captain and I ended up doing this for quite a while. And it allowed me to get involved with uh, what I would say is the intelligentsia of the Vietnamese population, uh, the teachers, the professors, and whatnot. And at the same time, you know, get up in front of a classroom of, you know, Vietnamese people and try and teach them English. Were and these adults? Or? Adults, children, the, the whole rank. And mm -hmm. many of them had a good understanding of English. I mean, we had been in countries since 64, so seven years later, they knew how to communicate fairly well, and I think they were trying to uh, become more proficient. And uh, I can remember trying to explain to them what it was to be like in a, an American supermarket. Unfortunately, what I was doing was basically bragging about how much we had. And I can remember one of the Vietnamese teachers uh, at his home taking me aside and saying, you know, you know don't really want to do it this way. And, you know, here's, here's again, it's my being young and naive and not realizing what I was doing. And, and, but they were, it was interesting because it, it helped me mature, understand things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. It also gave me an insight into the well-educated Vietnamese people. And over uh, tea or, or whatever, there would be conversations about how they felt things were going, how they viewed the American presence, how they viewed uh, the future, which was sort of negative. Because I think at this time the writing was on the wall of what was going to happen in Vietnam. And uh, their fear of that, which became fulfilled. Uh, so it was, it was a mind-wakening experience. It was also gratifying because I felt like I was doing something good. There was a lot of boredom in country. Uh, I mean, even though... The, the things that you do see are uh, at that time and uh, things were dying down to some extent you know the, the heavy fighting for the most part was behind us uh, <clears throat> uh, the act I think w primarily with many of the other units and here again this probably contributed to the uh, drug usage and, and alcoholism and everything else boredom was, was one of the big things more than anything else at least with the fifth, we were busy. I mean, there was the work going on with the villagers, uh, the works with the Mont Yards. I realized that we really had nothing to do with basically the rest of the Army units. And with the Navy and stuff, our primary purpose was stealing whatever we could get from them. <laughs> but it was interesting. We'd go out and steal, you know, a new Jeep or uh, some type of vehicle or something from their mess. And as they raced back into the 5th Special Forces, uh, uh, area, we had our own guards on the gates, you know, we'd rush through and then the gates would shut, and by the time they were able to come back to get access, you know, new serial numbers and registrations would be put on the vehicle and things like that. It was pretty interesting. <laughs> now, were you able to get promoted while you were over there? You know, I didn't. I ended up, uh, I went over as a specialist four, mm -hmm. and I was high on the list for E5, and uh, Unfortunately, I was in the Cameron Bay Hospital when the test came up, so I missed it. Otherwise, I would have gotten it in country. I ended up getting my uh, sergeant stripes as soon as I got back to the states at Fort Meade. Mm -hmm. So I, I missed out on four or five months of that. Why were you in the hospital? I had a lipoma removed on my left side. Had uh, just something that was there, mm -hmm. and decided that we should take a look at it. So it got me some R and R for a few days. Did you get any uh, anything uh, malaria, jungle rot? Uh, I, I want to think. Any? I have a problem with my toes, mm -hmm. especially with my large toes, and I I attribute that <clears throat> to the constant feet being wet and, and things like that. I, I think it just got some type of uh, disease in there that you know it's never really been corrected. It's nothing that's debilitating or mm -hmm. anything like that, but I attribute that uh, to being constantly wet. <laughs> Okay. Um, I, don't know. I guess, do you have any other anecdotes about while you were there? Well, I, I think I mentioned on the forum I sent in, uh, uh, I met Martha Ray. Martha Ray, the movie actress from the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm, yeah. and I think she traveled with Bob Hope quite a bit. And 
I happened to be working in the Mars station, and I think what was also happening, uh, CID was right next to us, and we were getting ready to change the MPC script. So they're going to lock down the whole country right. so that the script couldn't be changed or traded in. Well, we always got that information a little bit earlier, so we did what we had to do to, you know, make a few dollars on the side. But it was like probably 10, 11 o'clock at night, and Martha Ray, who was, I think, and I'm pretty sure of this, was an honorary colonel mm -hmm. in the 5th, yeah. yeah. uh, comes in with a few other women and a few other civilians, and all I can remember is partying extremely heavy with her and her friends. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I, I can't, even with this tape on, I can't say everything that happened <laughs> that night, but uh, let's say she took advantage of a, an 18-year-old naive high school kid in a sense, not, not in a sexual sense, so let me put that out, but uh, drank a lot more hard liquor than I was used to, and uh, actually, in, before I think I, I lost <laughs> consciousness, uh, talked to her, really, in a, in a short period of time, got to know her a little bit, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was, yeah, I still remember that quite vividly up to that point. <laughs> How did you feel about the uh, South Vietnamese soldiers? Did you have much contact with them, their units? What we had, we didn't have a lot of respect for this Arvin soldier. Mm -hmm. I, I think the writing was on the wall uh, of their dependability. Uh, and... Uh, lack thereof of, of depending on them. Uh, we worked primarily with the Montyards, which I think had subsequently been genocided by the North Vietnamese. Uh, they would throw their bodies in front of you to, to save your life. The Vietnam, Vietnamese, South Vietnamese regular would hightail it. Uh, that's probably all I'll say about that. Okay. How long were you in Vietnam? Approximately 11, 12 months. Mm -hmm. we, uh, when I went over, we were held up under Nixon's Vietnamization program. I think they were trying to get an accurate count. So I, I spent like six, seven weeks at Fort Lewis, which was all dead time. And I had recently been married, so you know this was not the way to start off a marriage. Uh, we actually were the first unit deactivated in 1971 in, in February or March. And I can remember... Personally, I actually folded the flag and presented it to a Congressman Mendel Rivers' wife. Uh, he was the congressman from uh, Fort Bragg, that represented Fort Bragg. And being the first unit activated in 63 or 64, uh, we were the first unit deactivated in 71 under Nixon's Vietnamization program, as far as I understand. And I gave her the, the flag as it came down at the, the 5th headquarters. Okay, um, after you, when you arrived home, you alluded to this once earlier, were you aware of the anti-war movement and the demonstration? Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, you couldn't miss it. Uh, you know, the Armed Forces Radio, uh, the music, uh, everything that we did get in Vietnam, I mean, we were sequestered. I mean, we could, you know, we got television feeds and everything else and papers and stuff. Uh, and by this time, the anti-Vietnam uh, effort had, you know, been going strong for five years, so it was, it was, you know, we were all well aware of it. Uh, it personally affected me, and I think probably one of the most traumatic experiences in this, in the sense of my military experience. The couple of days, the night before, and this has been going on for a few days, but the night before we left country, most of us had turned in our weapons. So we were left with things like uh, carbines, uh, carbines and uh, uh, <laughs> crossbows or whatever. Our command sergeant major had a girlfriend in town, and we had to go down and get him, which meant we had to go out around the perimeter, et cetera, et cetera. This was Charlie's last opportunity to really hit us. So we were taking some small arms and, and you know mortar attacks and stuff the last few days. Nothing, nothing really serious, but, you know, you were conscious of it. The last thing you want to be is a recipient of one of those, uh, you know, when you got less than 16 hours in country. <clears throat> and I can remember going on a Jeep and uh, being on a machine gun, 
going down to pick up the sergeant major, thinking this is really pretty crazy because he should be back here anyways. And, mm -hmm. you know, but he was getting his last licks in, so to speak. <clears throat> Went and got him, came back. Uh, sort of a blur what we did before we got on the plane at 5 a.m. in the morning. Flew into Fort Lewis. I think we stopped at to in Tokyo and then Fort Lewis. Most of the individuals I was with on, on the Flying Tigers plane were being mustered out, you know, to your uh, draftees mm -hmm. or whatever. <clears throat> I unfortunately had orders for Germany, so I had a. They had given me special orders and additional leave, so I could get to the Pentagon and have my orders changed uh, to something stateside. Because being married, I didn't want to go from Vietnam to Germany and right. stuff. And they recognized that. So I got into Fort Lewis got out as quick as possible, uh, didn't stay for the state dinner or things like that because I'm, I'm on leave right now and, you know, I'm still in the Army. And I uh, got a plane out of Tacoma and flew into Denver. And I can remember being spit at by more than one individual. And I, I can remember a, a businessman in a suit witnessing it. And he took me by the arm and uh, bought me a beer. And from there... I flew into Newark. Now my wife was living with my parents and my four siblings in Colony. And they knew I was on the way home, but they didn't know when. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> from Newark, caught the Port Authority bus up to Albany. And I think from Albany, uh, I don't know if I hitchhiked or got a bus. I, I don't know how I got from Albany up to Colony, which is about 10, 12, 15 miles. But I can remember walking down my neighborhood street like at 11.30 at night and going up to my parents' home, bang, you know, walking in the door and saying, hey, I'm home. And I, a few of my high school buddies came down. And I think it was the strangest feeling trying to explain to them when they said, how's it been, what have you been doing? Trying to explain to them what less than 36 hours ago, and, and actually only 12 hours because of the international dateline, trying to explain to them where I'd been and what I was doing less than two days earlier, because all this time I'm basically awake, a little tired because of just traveling. And uh, that, that was weird. It was a weird feeling, you know, trying to, and I mean, we've all gone through this before and stuff, you know, there was no bands, there's no, you know, you just sort of filtered back in and then what about, if you were being mustered out, you just sort of blended back into society and brought back whatever baggage you had, or like myself, I'm taking a trip down to the Pentagon and getting my orders changed because I don't want to go to Germany. So you ended up uh, going to uh, the Pentagon and then you went to Bragg? Yeah, uh, no, I went to Fort Meade. I went to the Pentagon and I'll never forget the, it was a captain who came up to me because, I mean, the Pentagon was, is a massive installation. And at the time, in, in the early 70s, 71, they had people that did nothing but roam the halls looking for people that looked lost, I think. Mm -hmm. And this captain comes up to me, and I was in civilian clothes because I had forgotten a part of my uniform. I'd been told to make sure I wear my uniform, but I, I didn't, so I think I had jeans on and a sweater. And I had my orders with me and everything else. And this captain comes up to me. Half his face was gone. Never fit, never fit, a thin guy, taller than myself, but half his face was, like, gone. And I said, sir, I just came back from Vietnam. They want to send me to Germany. He told me I could come here and get my orders changed took me by the arm, he says, we'll take care of you in two seconds. And within less than five minutes, I'm in an office, and they're asking me, where do you live and where do you want to be stationed? And I said, uh, I live in Albany and any place between here and there. And they said, well, how do you like to go to Fort Meade? You know, just up the, up the Beltway. Sounds good. And uh, uh, they looked at, you know, my, my uh, records and whatnot. And that's how I got assigned to the 6th Mil Military Intelligence Unit. But it was, it was remarkable how, up until this point, everything in the Army, as you're probably well aware, never got done right. <laughs> Always slow, and if it gets screwed up, it was. I, I have here a binder of every record that was ever given to me, because I was told, don't ever lose any of these papers. And I still have every one today. And I went into the Pentagon with this feeling of dread that, oh, this is not going to work, I'm going to be here forever. In less than 15 minutes, I had copies of orders for Fort Meade. My wife and I stopped up there. I met the base, uh, the company I was going to be assigned to. Went back home, enjoyed my leave, went back to work. What did you do with, with the 6th? Our, our primary mission at the 6th, we were a reforger unit. So 
besides our own training and setting up counterinsurgency lines behind enemy lines, if, if war broke out in Europe, we were going to be sent behind lines to set up communications, and etc. Uh, most of our time was spent preparing and training reservists and National Guard groups that would come in during the summer and spring. Uh, and, and that was basically, it was pretty, pretty good duty. Primarily officers, small company, I think it was 6MI. Uh, I think we had maybe 15 officers and about 10 enlisted men. You mentioned on your forum there was a captain that was a real character. Meese Ratley, Captain Meese Ratley from Texas. All I can say is take Burt Reynolds and uh, uh, something of that character, and, and that's Meese Ratley. Just a, a loud, bombastic individual that you immediately like, that's fair. That was sort of the Hawkeye Pierce type of mentality. Was in the army, but had probably better things to do. But made the best of it. But uh, didn't mind airing his uh, opinions sometimes. Uh, just, just somebody I happen to remember. I actually remember very few people uh, from my military period. Uh, hardly any. I don't think anyone from Vietnam, other than a few people that were from this area that I happened to meet. Uh, I had a teacher from the University of Maryland uh, that I took college entrance courses for while I was getting mustered out. Uh, a person by the name of Dr. Robert Pula that had a big impact on my life. And, uh, and Meese and a few other individuals. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to Vietnam a minute. Um, when you, you talked about the Jeeps and so on, did you make any modifications on any of the other than changing yeah. serial numbers, probably not, okay, and a no. new coat of paint. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, when were you discharged? I got out in April of 1972, just shy of three years. They were actually uh, riff, riffing people at that time to bring the numbers down. Did you ever make use of the GI Bill? Definitely. Went to Siena College on the GI Bill. Okay. Um, I know you you answered this. Did you join any veterans organizations? No, I haven't. Okay. Um, I think you answered this one, too. Uh, you never stayed in contact with anyone that served with you? No. Or that you served with? No. Okay. Um, how do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? Oh, definitely positive. There's a part of me that's sort of the John Wayne type mentality. Uh, I realized soon in the military that I could, three days after I was at Fort Dix in boot camp, I can remember sitting on a cot and taking out a little notebook and saying, God, have you screwed up? You know, you get barraged with all the tests and the hustling and haircutting and everything else. And I said to myself, you got three years of this, you spent three days already, you got 1,054 days left or whatever it was. And we had, uh, there was a, our drill instructor was a full-blooded Comanche Indian. And when I got into boot camp, one of the first things they did in July of 1969, where the weather was steaming, they do all the typical things to, to break you down immediately. Uh, we had to run around the quadrangle with our foot, foot lockers on our heads. Well, you'd run upstairs, get the foot locker, bring it downstairs, and no matter how fast you did, it was never going to be fast enough. I think we went in the third time to get the foot lockers, and our drill sergeant said, listen, you guys, why don't you just empty out the foot locker? We all, you know, a little light bulb. So we all empty out the foot lockers, we go out, get in formation, and because we didn't do something fast enough, the four or five platoons, about 180 men, were all running around the quadrangle. Well, everybody else is like this, and we're like this. <laughs> it gave me a lot of respect for our drill sergeant. He was fair. Uh, I don't remember his name. It's hopefully in some of the records I would have. The night before graduation, he was a, besides being a full-blooded Comanche, he was also black belt. And all I can remember is the night before we graduated, uh, there was an incident in our barracks where I, as I was coming upon the barracks, the door flew open. These were the old Pershing-style wooden two-story barracks, 50, 70 years old. This black serviceman, I think he was a 
one of the cooks comes flying out the door. Apparently he never even touched the stair. Uh, got pretty well hurt. I think they took him to the hospital. And unfortunately our drill sergeant wasn't able to attend graduation ceremonies because they threw him in jail. But I'll never forget him because he was fair, had a little problem with drinking and whatnot, but uh, he had our best interest at heart, which I'm not sure if it was the same in the other barracks. Uh, he had made me a platoon sergeant. Uh, here again, I think that had a lot to do with being one of the few enlisted men in, in the company. <clears throat> and, I, and I realized that you can either fight the Army, and you're going to lose. You'll lose every time. Or you can manipulate it and serve its needs and also serve your own without brown nosing. You don't brown nose. I chose to manipulate it. So I usually uh, was able to do the things I wanted to do as long as I did my job. Uh, and, and that's how I got through the, the military. And I liked, I liked the military to some extent. I almost stayed in. My sergeant, uh, my commanding officer with the 6th Military Intelligence uh, Company, Alton R. Westrick. Big on sports, but couldn't play any himself. But he wanted the best softball team, best bowling team track team. I did them all. Uh, he had on his desk for me a $10,000 voucher for re-upping for six years, immediate promotion to staff sergeant, and also orders for Fort Huachuca Officers Candidate School. All I had to do was sign the paper. My wife had a good job in Laurel, Maryland, off base. We lived off base. Uh, the duty was good. Most of the time I wore civilian clothes, being with intelligence, we didn't wear fatigues very often. On one particular day, wearing fatigues, I went to the PX to pick up some uh, groceries. It was extremely windy. I'm coming out, and I'm 21 years old, I think. I came out of the PX, and I had my baseball cap in my hand. And a brigadier general, fat, not much on his sleeve at all, called upon me and said, Soldier. And as soon as I heard his voice, I, said, oh, I, I can see this coming. And I just missed getting Soldier of the Month by one person a week before. He calls me over and he says, Soldier, you're out of uniform. And I said, Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. It won't happen again, sir. It was because I had my baseball cap in my hand. And I immediately got in the car. Instead of going home, I went back to company headquarters. And walked in and told the commanding officer you could take all the orders and tear them up. And I got out, you know, six or seven, eight weeks later, whatever it was. Those, that's one of the crossroads, I think, in your life. Because part of me really wanted to sign the records. I, didn't, I knew I had to go back home. I had to start school again. If I, wanted, I didn't have a job. I had all these things facing a young married person. Being a veteran at that point wasn't something you, you wanted to speak too much about. And the alternative was staying in where I felt secure, where I was fairly comfortable, knew I could maneuver my way through it, but at the same time, wasn't not proud of, of serving my country. And, but seeing the faults in, in many things, I, I matured a lot in three years. I mean, I think I started reading the Pentagon Papers and things started making sense and just uh, some of those, you know, the, seeing what happened in Vietnam to the people and your comrades and stuff uh, makes it, you grow up a lot. But at the same time, I was fortunate to be in extremely good companies with professional people and that basically did their job and weren't tainted with the, the drugs and some of the other things going on. And that appealed to me. And it was also the security. They didn't have to worry about health, health insurance and Sort of like the idea of becoming an officer, though I think sergeants were more powerful. <laughs> but I probably, it would have been interesting to see where I would have been 20, 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. As it is, I ended up getting a job with the federal government and almost did it the same way, only in civilian clothes. For the, I just retired a year and a half ago after 30 years with the feds. So it, it worked out fine uh, both ways. But I sort of always wonder if that incident hadn't happened in the parking lot, you know, Mm -hmm. My life probably would have been quite different, different, different mm -hmm. path. Do you ever read much about Vietnam? Oh, definitely. Uh, I was a political science major. Uh, I've, uh, I've read Hackworth's books, uh, seen the movies. 
studied it a lot in, in Vietnam. I, I'm a, my minor was history. Uh, I'm probably well read on the subject. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your interview. Well, thank you very much. Now you have some s typical. This was a picture of myself. One of the things that we did is we. Quite hard to here. see. Yep, here. Yep. We had to install many of the uh, antennas for communications in the radio system, and whatnot. And one of the first things I did was uh, assist. Uh, this is actually Staff Sergeant uh, Staff Sergeant First Class Burn was his name. He was a seasoned uh, Green Beret, and he and I had to install a new antenna on top of the tower. How much is you? Uh, I'm the young guy in the white shirt. <laughs> And I can say what was interesting about this, I'd never been up that high. I think the towers were 50, 75 f five feet tall. And one of the things you're worried about is possibly being shot at because mm -hmm. you're a pretty big target up there. Especially with a white T-shirt. Yeah, white T-shirt and everything else. Uh, it was extremely hot over in Vietnam. But what was interesting is I felt I couldn't let go of this tower. You got a belt down, but I'm like, geez. And... <clears throat> Byrne realized that I wasn't going to be very effective until I could actually let go of the tower. So he said something to me like, you know, look over there or something like that. And as I turned my head, ran me in the chest so I fell back. And as I fell back and my arms left go of the tower, I'm suspended with just the belt. Well, from that point on, I could work on the tower because now he realized the belt was going to hold me. And uh, we ended up doing that quite often over the next 12 months. And the other things are just snapshots that probably too hard to see. Uh, probably one of the more significant ones is, and I've seen this in magazines and books and everything else. This was uh, the headquarters building for the 5th Special Forces in the Trang. Uh, famous, famous building. Like to, it's interesting to know what may have happened to our, all the facilities that we had once the Russians came in. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we, we had pretty decent digs most of the time that we were there. Now, those are typical typical pictures. Now, were you allowed uh, to wear the beret thing that you were assigned to them? No. No, I basically wore a baseball cap. Okay. So I, I, I think I had to do my uh, airborne to wear the beret. Mm -hmm. And when I signed up for the last uh, course, the last time they were going to uh, present it at Dong Bidin was the area, uh, they ended up canceling it because I think the writing was already on the walls <clears throat> that we were probably going to be deactivated in the next eight to nine months. So that was an in-country jump school? Yeah, and uh, it replaced the training that I would have gotten at Fort Benning. Okay. Uh, subsequently, I have jumped, though. I've done tandems and I've done static lines in civilian life. Okay. Anything else? Any? Did you want to show us? Uh... Well, you know, I'm sure people have seen before. These are actually... Typical, real jungle fatigues. Uh, these were presented to me by the mine yards in Vietnam, and I have a few sets of these. No shirts, just the uh, just the pants. And our company markings and you know whatnot. Basically, you had your colored. This is the Fifth Special Forces insignia. In Vietnam, you usually had the ones without the color less of a target, and colored was stateside. Sure. And typical, you know, casual wear, your khaki. Khakis. And then your, your regular uh, fatigues that we also wore in country. Most of this stuff has changed. Mm -hmm. But it was all, you know, basically effective. It all got wet, stayed wet for a long time. Nothing exciting for the most mm -hmm. part, but did the job. Okay. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.